Welcome. While everyone finishes signing in on today's webinar, please take a moment to use the question box at the very bottom of your screen to write what you think is the most pressing mental health issue facing Kentucky's children and youth today. Welcome to the 18th Annual Howard L. Boast Memorial Health Policy Forum, brought to you by the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky. My name is Amalia Mendoza. I am Senior Program Officer at the Foundation, and I'm delighted to get us started today. We're doing the forum a little differently this year because of the pandemic. Instead of meeting together for a full day, we've turned the forum into a monthly webinar series. And we're delighted that you have chosen to join us for this, which is the fourth in this five webinar series. We encourage you to visit our website to learn about each one of the other webinars in the series. The Foundation for Healthy Kentucky is a nonprofit, nonpartisan 501c3 organization that has one overriding goal, and that is to improve the health of Kentuckians. Toward that end, we offer this forum free of charge. In memory of Howard L. Bose, the forum is designed to highlight programs and policies that, based on real-world evidence, actually result in improved health outcomes. The Bose Forum is an example of the Foundation's approach to policy advocacy. We bring together Kentucky residents, providers, educators, and policy leaders to learn about and lend their support to programs and policies that are proven to help Kentucky adopt implement and expand health improvement success stories. This approach is also behind the Kentucky Coalition for Health Children, which is now seeking additional member organizations. The foundation is the backbone organization for this newly launched coalition. I am the coalition coordinator. And the coalition will work to identify and promote policies to improve children's health in the school setting. To learn more about the Kentucky Coalition for Healthy Children, go to KentuckyHealthyChildren.org. Now on to today's event. The title of this year's BOAST Policy Forum is Moving Kids Towards Natural High. And we're focusing on programs and policies that help move Kentucky kids away from substance abuse, suicide, and other risk behaviors, and towards healthier behaviors that will benefit them throughout their lives. Our partner in this year's forum is the Kentucky Youth Advocate which is the Commonwealth's independent voice for kids. I know you join me in thanking them for their work to improve child well-being in our state. I'm happy now to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Sheila Schuster. Dr. Schuster is a licensed psychologist and executive director of the Advocacy Action Network. She's advocated on behalf of Kentuckians with mental illness and other disabilities and to increase access to health care across the Commonwealth for more than 40 years. She's also a member of the Foundation's Community Advisory Council. We're honored to have her moderate today's forum. Thank you, Amalia, and welcome to you all. Today's webinar is Understanding Youth and Building Good Mental Health. The focus is on programs and policies that can help us better understand children and youth, especially during these troubled times and interventions to help them build, restore, or strengthen their good mental health. I personally believe that 2020 has presented more challenges to our youth, particularly to their mental health and well-being, than any time in recent memory. The twin pandemics of COVID-19 and racial injustice have created serious disruptions in their lives. It is more important than ever that the community of young people, parents, educators, advocates, policymakers, and professionals come together to provide supports and resources for our youth. We are very pleased this afternoon to have four outstanding speakers with us today. I'll give them each a short introduction and suggest that you go to the Foundation's website if you want more information on their background. 
Each will speak for about 10 minutes, and then we will open the webinar up for your questions. Let me do a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. All audience and speaker microphones should now be on mute. This helps reduce background noise. If you're posting on social media about this webinar, please use the hashtag 2020 Boast Forum. You are welcome to write in your questions at any time during the webinar. You don't need to wait until the Q&A session at the end. Just type your question whenever you think of it in the Q&A box at the very bottom of the webinar screen. If you want an answer from a particular speaker, please note that person's name so I can direct the question to them. I will try to get to every question during the live webinar, but if I don't get to yours, please know that we will capture the question and get a response emailed to you later. Finally, I want to note that all five of the Boast Forum webinars are being recorded and then posted on the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky website. The link is on your screen now. And we'll show it again at the end of today's webinar. Please take the time to visit that website and watch the other three webinars that have already taken place. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Felicia Smith. Dr. Smith is a clinical psychologist who has practiced in Louisville since 2004. She is co-owner of Strong Minds, a child and youth psychology practice. She has served as an assistant professor and director of psychological testing at the University of Louisville School of Medicine and continues to teach college courses in the U of L Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences, as well as giving presentations and workshops to the public. Dr. Smith, take it away. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Schuster, for that introduction. Um, I would like to begin by thanking the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky and the Kentucky Youth Advocates for putting on this very timely forum. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be a part of this effort to help move youth toward healthy behaviors, strong well-being, and positive outcomes. Um, as a child and adolescent psychologist, as a youth advocate, and as a parent of a preteen and a teenager, I am currently immersed in child development, both professionally and personally. So I am thrilled to be here having this discussion. My focus today is to help with the understanding of youth, and in particular, understanding youth in the context of the stressors and challenges that we are all currently experiencing. Um, and that brings me to the title of my talk, Child and Adolescent Development Disrupted. So my plan for today is threefold. I'd like to highlight some of the major milestones associated with typical development among youth. Uh, and then I'll discuss the intersection of the, the path in pursuing those milestones and the current interference of, this, of the disruptive events that we are all enduring. And like many scholars, I propose that we are really experiencing a confluence of pandemics, uh, that of COVID-19 and the, the social unrest associated with racial trauma and racial tensions that have come to the surface in 2020. And finally, I will share some practical information for how we might mitigate the impact of these disruptors in preserving children's well-being during these stressful times. So here I've identified some of the key developmental tasks associated with different age groups. Um, so beginning with early and middle childhood, uh, youth are engaged in beginning those in learning the beginning skills of emotion regulation and emotion emotional attachment with others. Um, they are learning to use their language to express their ideas and understand the ideas and experiences of others. Um, cognitive development or intellectual development is also happening actively. And children are exploring and gaining motor skills. And finally, they're also learning how to interact with, connect with, and to be friends with others. And their daily experiences in school, in extracurricular activities, at home, in their faith institutions are helping them to pursue and achieve these developmental tasks. 
And then as youth move into adolescence, they're still working on these skills that I previously mentioned. I think all of us, all of us who have been in the vicinity of a teenager know that they haven't mastered those skills just yet. It's a work in progress. So we know that adolescence is a time of big changes, um, which could place teens at an increased risk for maladaptive coping when faced with significant stress. It's during adolescence that teens begin to deepen their connections with peers and shift even greater importance on those connections. So this is the stage in life when they are very invested in social relationships and in separating from their parents. Related to this desire to connect, dating behaviors also typically emerge during these years. Additional key aspects of adolescence are the development of one's personal identity and striving for independence and autonomy. Teens are working to create a sense of self that is personally meaningful and is based on the integration of values and experiences. And this is partly why risk-taking behaviors become more prevalent during this time span. Teens are beginning to explore the boundaries of their world, their interests and their beliefs, um, and society's beliefs as their self-definition starts to take shape. And some of this risk-taking is positive and normative and healthy, and some is not so positive or healthy. And we're going to hear more about that during today's webinar. So child development is happening. We're not able to press the pause button while we endure and persevere through the challenges that we're facing today or as um, I'm calling them, these disruptors. So let's consider this first disruptor, the um, COVID-19 pandemic. So the pandemic has led to necessary shutdowns in the service of protecting the physical health of the public. And whereas this has been protective and we can appreciate the benefits, the mental health impacts have been great and we suspect they will continue to be realized for some time to come. The stress that's associated with the pandemic is related to the isolation itself um, and the reduced uh, social life and physical activities, um, changes in routines, how children are spending their days, um, the increased use of, of screens and devices, um, a break in caregiving and break in learning and healthcare. We know that there's been some discontinuity in those aspects of children's lives and certainly missing significant events um, and uh, rites of passage that have been a typical staple in the developmental trajectory of our youth. And then finally, um, many families are experiencing economic insecurity during these trying times. So we can see the ways in which these challenges, uh, the challenges that COVID-19 has brought are in conflict with the developmental tasks that we've discussed for children and adolescents. Let's talk about another disruptor that of the social unrest that we're experiencing related to issues of systematic racism and racial trauma. So, and I want to say that um, it's easy to argue that youth of color and Black youth in particular are uniquely impacted by racial trauma. Um, I would submit to you that racial trauma and the associated racial tensions are impacting all of our youth. These difficult realities that we are all facing are challenging and they are challenging the mental health and development and well-being of all children and adolescents. We know that ongoing stress can have a wear and tear effect on kids and on their developing brains and their biological systems. Constant coping with systematic racism, discrimination, and racial tensions are potent activators of the internal stress response. And additionally, the external factors such as witnessing racial violence impacts uh, the, the social and cultural environment 
in which our children are living and growing. And when um, what, what we know for our, from the research is that when young adults recall racist events that they experienced or witnessed as a child, their stress response is similar to that of first responders after major disasters. So I want to point out that the research is um, robust in demonstrating the impact of racial trauma and racial um, events or racist-based events for the developing the development of youth. Racism is deeply personal to many children. The messages of racism, that of inferiority and that differences are bad, is counter to the developmental task of creating a healthy identi identity as we previously, as I previously discussed. And when we think about the impact of racial tensions and racial trauma on our youth, including the ongoing stress, the racial violence, and the impact on one's developing self, we can appreciate that this is a public health impact and that we need to treat it as a public health challenge. Finally, um, the goal for our webinar today is to identify strategies for promoting healthy outcomes among youth. We will hear useful information on how to do that. I would like to speak in some general terms about work that we can all do to help mitigate the impact of these disruptors. So first, we must recognize and acknowledge the fear, the stress, and the unique challenges that are faced by our youth. Um, programming and funding needs to be targeted at these age groups to preserve their well-being. It will be important that we find ways to help children stay socially connected. Uh, many families are working hard to balance the need to protect their physical health with the need to promote their mental health. And um, it's a, a difficult challenge, but a worthwhile one to undertake. We want to build str a strong sense of identity and pride we have to create creative ways to encourage self-exploration during these times when um, during these times that are really working against that because of the restrictions that that we're all facing i want to encourage each of us to think of how we might model healthy behaviors for our youth um, we can model for them how to cope well with similar disruptors um, bear in mind that children are um, Influ are easily influenced, and so we want to be sure that they are experiencing positive examples of how to cope during difficult times. And lastly, we want to help our children become a part of the solution. Um, having active ways to interact and to be helpful um, promotes feelings of empowerment and combats feelings of helplessness. helplessness. So I'll say that this public health challenge um, that we are all facing is, um, I'm sorry, this public, we are all facing this pu public health challenge and we want to support our youth in developing in this abnormal or atypical environment. Um, I look forward to our discussion as I believe it will move us in the direction of improving programs, enhancing our efforts and impacting the lives of our youth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. That gives us a great overview of the developmental task and how these twin pandemics can interrupt them. And now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Alan Brenzel. Dr. Brenzel is a psychiatrist who serves as medical director for the Kentucky Department for Behavioral Health, Developmental, and Intellectual Disabilities. He is also an associate professor of psychiatry and pediatrics at the University of Kentucky. Dr. Brenzel has developed broad health policy expertise across many areas and has worked to develop coordinated systems of care. He has served in state government for more than 20 years. Dr. Brenzel, we're very pleased to have you as a presenter today. Thank you. It's my absolute pleasure to be here and, again, would like to thank the uh, Foundation for Healthy Kentucky and Kentucky Youth Advocates for bringing 
attention to the behavioral health of our youth and families. And so uh, just want to let you know uh, who I am in terms of that I do serve in state government. And so I work in the Department of Behavioral Health, as Dr. Schuster mentioned. Uh, my commissioner is uh, Dr. Wendy Morris, uh, and uh, she supports my being here as well as others in the Cabinet for Health and Family Services. And, and so in the way of some brief review, Dr. Smith is already um, elucidated these specific impacts, and I do just want to add that I, I do believe that this is a confluence of multiple stresses on families and youth, including COVID, uh, and, and primarily focused on that, but also the lack of racial equity. And then I've been very involved in the opioid epidemic and the impact of the opioid crisis on families and youth, and this current confluence is exacerbating that as well. So Dr. Smith mentioned specifically uh, anxiety that individuals will feel in relation to fear of the illness itself. And this needs to be understood in a developmentally appropriate way. Very much different what a six-year-old might hear and worry about than a 16-year-old. And so it's very important that we understand and help our youth process this information in a developmentally appropriate way. But already mentioned is the social isolation, the grief due to loss of milestone events, and those of you in the central Kentucky area, the Herald Leader this weekend had a very nice uh, expose regarding a young woman who's a high school student in Frankfurt, and she spoke very eloquently about the specific losses uh, for students of her age, but also the loss of access to support systems, um, such as family, uh, extended family, uh, specific therapies that a person might have been receiving, access to day programs for those with more extensive needs. These are all significantly interrupted from a systems perspective right now, which is leading to stress on families, which is leading to stress for individuals who have less access to their services, um, as well as a stress for our extended family members who are not able to spend time with their youth. And we all know the research around resiliency. It's very important to have adults who believe in, uh, in you and who, who believe you're special and you don't have as much access to your extended support systems. That can be a real challenge. And then we are actually losing family members and the grief associated with that. And I think I already mentioned is the economic impact, families and caregivers trying to negotiate employment or lack thereof, working from home, non-traditional uh, methods of instructions, being responsible. Uh, and we do know that the rate and, and incidence typically in times of hardships of, of child abuse and neglect uh, uh, can increase. And yet we have uh, fewer opportunities to recognize and ob observe that right now. And so I wanted to, uh, um, I have some trouble with my slides here, but I, I, my graph here, I don't know if it's showing up on your screen, but it's not. But basically what I had in this box is some evidence that we're beginning to see from a system perspective of uh, increased uh, anxiety, number one. Uh, and so a recent study from the World Health Organization showed that youth are now reporting up to 28% of the time significant anxiety, which is a doubling from the previous baseline of 14%. And so we do believe our youth are, are experiencing considerably in, increase in their anxiety. And then the overall emergency room visits are, for youth are up substantially, and that's what the graph was intended to show. Not up as much in 5 to 11, but when you get up to 12 to 17, we're seeing uh, really since about week 15 of the uh, epidemic that uh, rates are dr dramatically accelerating of emergency of the youth seeking uh, services for mental health crisis in emergency rooms. Um, so what have we done from a system perspective, which is where I, I still see patients, but I primarily work now in a systems uh, perspective. And these are some of the things I want you to be aware of. And, and also want to congratulate all of you, because what I believe is that you all are, are heroes. Those of you who work in healthcare systems, those of you who are individual clinicians, you have responded in ways that I don't believe any of us thought were humanly possible. Uh, a year ago, and you deserve incredible credit for that. But what we've seen is a rapid move to the delivery of services via telehealth. Those are up over 400% in the behavioral health world. And ours in behavioral health are up substantially more than those in overall health care. So it's the behavioral health community that is now seeing the most rapid and quick transition to, to providing telehealth services. And, and so we've also worked with boards of licensure to remove a specific restrictions around providing remote services via telehealth and phones. 
We've reduced barriers to insurance companies covering behavioral health services, uh, like eliminating uh, for certain payers, particularly in the Medicaid world, uh, pre-authorization requirements. We, there have been a number of federal uh, programs that have offered direct financial assistance to providers because we know as providers, this is expensive to shift, to buy the technology, to buy the PPE if you are seeing folks face to face, to make uh, and deal with the fact that you have policies around quarantine and, and you're losing staff. And the other thing we need to be very cognizant of, not everyone has access to online and internet services. And we'll talk about some populations where this is particularly a challenge, but uh, we are working with other agencies to assist. Churches are, are offering hotspots. Other community organizations are offering places people can go who don't have good quality internet access. And then looking overall about how racial disparities has impacted historically access to behavioral health care, but now within this pandemic, that kind of uh, analysis is even more. But what concerns me most, and I'll show you a graph, is, is that we really don't know the behavioral health impact uh, of this crisis. We've never really experienced this protracted of a, of a, of a disaster. And historically, we don't see uh, the full uh, impact of a disaster until six to 18 months after this. So what I'm concerned about is down the road, and what I, I really believe is that we all are going to have to work together to support an enhanced crisis service. And we're gonna need to recognize that the public health response to COVID is not just vaccination and a medical response, but enhancing and building our public behavioral health and our overall behavioral health provider networks to deal with this are going to be very critical. And so I mentioned that some populations that I have particular concern about, and those already mentioned are those with limited internet access, those who receive services via school-based clinics. We just know that in some of our clinics, folks who we're seeing, we're just losing contact with about 10% of them. They're not uh, participating in telehealth. We're not able to reach them. Schools are losing contact with a, a subset of individuals. And those are youth who I think we all need to be looking for. How can we reach them? Where are they? Are they interfacing with healthcare in other places? But it is, it is a challenge. Also, in terms of moving to telehealth, it doesn't work well uh, with folks with intellectual disabilities in many cases. It also doesn't work as well for recognizing and diagnosing substance use and misuse. And so working to make sure we do have face-to-face -face services that are delivered in a safe and responsible way for those populations. And first episode psychosis typically requires inpatient care. And with the increased demand, we are seeing our inpatient psychiatric adolescent services at times full. And so we're seeing backups in emergency departments. And then I already mentioned a concern about youth at risk for maltreatment. Uh, and, and, and so one of the things we are worried is what is the impact of this going to be? And this is one of those uh, research uh, curves that has been uh, prepared for specifically for natural disasters or large-scale uh, traumatic or, or natural disasters. And what you see is a, in the very early stages is that you get an increase in emotional highs around when, co when communities come together and people feel part of, uh, of addressing and tackling. But afterwards is when we get a significant downturn and, and more emotional lows all the way out to a, a year um, and there are other triggering events, and some of these triggering events may be racial disparities, lack of access, anniversary reactions, and so I, I do think we're just beginning to see the uh, uh, impact. So I did want to just show that, that overall one of our concerns is suicide rates. We have not yet seen an increase in suicide rates in youth, which is a good thing. These are some longitudinal data, and we had been making progress and seeing a decrease, and so we're going to need to keep an eye on this. Um, suicide prevention is a beyond the scope of this brief presentation, but I just want you to look at graphs like this that show, how, and then think of this with a COVID lens and how many of these things might be impacted, including abuse, negative expectancy, uh, losses. And so our concern is, is that we are going to be at risk of seeing an increase. So we need to work together around suicide prevention. That's something that requires multiple interventions at multiple levels all the way from family to youth to school to healthcare to our communities. And I think you all probably know some of the, the, uh, the characteristics of uh, and what we need to know. But these are the characteristics of a system level intervention and really developing 
system-wide screening, uh, developing uh, evidence-based practices, being able to feel confident about treating suicidal ideation in youth, making sure that we're studying our impacts, uh, our interventions to make sure they work, and then working on warm handoff. And so I've provided some resources uh, that I will leave, and hopefully these will be posted because that's the one thing we want to be sure is, is that our youth know where to turn for help. They know how to get um, uh, help if they're uh, having an impact of this disaster, uh, particularly subgroups. There's now text lines. There's warm lines. Uh, and again, these should be posted for uh, on the uh, Foundation for Healthy Kentucky website. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Brenzel. It's so helpful to get a sense of how our mental health system in Kentucky is responding to youth and families as they experience these crises. Our next speaker is a young adult, Beatrice Roussel. We think it's very important to hear the perspective of students in this webinar series, so we're very pleased to have uh, Ms. Roussel join us. She is a graduate of Manual High School in Louisville and is now a first-year student at Colorado College and a youth mental health advocate. At Manual, she was active in the youth suicide prevention group called STAMINA, which stands for the Student Alliance for Mental Health Innovation and Action, as well as a youth member of NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Ms. Roussel. Good afternoon. Um, so as she said, I um, am the youth speaker, and I think that it's extremely important to incorporate youth perspectives on um, mental health policy, particularly right now when you know, everything's changing. Um, so as she mentioned, I was part of STAMINA, which was the Student Alliance for Mental Health Innovation and Action. This was a student-founded organization at my high school. Um, we did a lot of projects regarding or with um, that emphasize like youth advocacy and, and mental health for youth. So with the Ocean Discussion Cards, this was a project that was working to stimulate conversation um, among family members and peers about mental health um, and to make that more, uh, more fluid and easier to talk about before um, it was necessary. And then I also worked with a youth summit right before the pandemic hit. Uh, this was in March when we got together and uh, this was students from all across Kentucky, and we worked to provide them with tools for mental health advocacy and ways that they could take back to their high school and peers. And then with the NAMI Louisville Youth Council, this was with the National Alliance for Mental Illness. And the goal of this was to educate on mental health, dispel these myths and misperceptions, and, and, and in turn eradicate the stigma that surrounds mental health. And you know, what I wanted to emphasize about these two organizations was, you know, the fundamental principle that when students are engaged and youth are engaged as solution partners, I think that we bring crucial insights to inform the development of youth and mental health policies and programs. And so, you know, with that, I think with COVID, it's important to get a youth perspective on how it's impacted us. So, um, you know, as a freshman in high school, I was diagnosed with a severe eating disorder and I you know, spent time in both the hospital and a treatment facility in Cincinnati. And, you know, my focus in working with these organizations was significantly influenced by this experience. But also, my years of treatment and therapy equipped me with skills that I can apply to almost every other area of my life. And I think that these skills became increasingly evident to me since the COVID pandemic began. Um, being stuck at home with little to no social interaction has been tax taxing on, you know, my mental health and a lot of my friends and other youth and as students, you know, we've gone from seeing friends five days a week at school to only Zoom calls and FaceTimes. And we've lost the ability to engage in many of the sports and extracurriculars that we base our lives around. We've been confined to sleeping and doing homework and talking to friends all in the same room. And that has led to a loss of structure and routine. And, you know, with this social isolation and the uncertainty of when this situation will end, all of our lives have been flipped upside down which has in turn largely impacted mental health. And I was a senior in high school when this began and have since transi transitioned to college. And throughout the past year, I have noticed starkly different reactions to the changes that COVID has brought um, among all of my peers. Um, I've seen one of my friends, you know, disappear for three days during a depressive episode. And I've seen someone re-engage in disordered eating for the first time in years. And I've also seen many resort to drugs and alcohol in order to cope. And 
But on the contrary, despite two 14-day quarantines alone in a single dorm room and a big move halfway through our semester because we got kicked off campus, many of my friends with me in Colorado have actually thrived. We've managed to live in an apartment on our own while doing well in school and making time for camping trips on the weekend. And, you know, it's fascinating to me to see the difference in ability to respond to this pandemic. And I think it comes back to a concept that Dr. Brenzel mentioned, which is, you know, resiliency. So psychological resiliency is the ability to mentally or emotionally cope with a crisis. And, you know, it exists in people who have, you know, psychological and behavioral capabilities that allow them to remain calm and get through a crisis or chaos without long-term negative consequences. And, you know, all of us have the potential for this resilience, but I think that it can be learned and fostered through experience and education and nurturing. Um, and there are many ways to cope with a stressful situation, and there are many ways to build this resiliency. Um, I think the, the organizations that I was a part of, we really stressed, you know, giving youth opportunities for self-care. You know, when I was in a quarantine at my college, they, they provided a lot of these self-care activities, and I think that it's extremely important. Um, however, what I want to emphasize is that I realize that it's only emphasized during times of trial. I think, you know, youth should be encouraged to engage in self-care activities daily, creating a habitual practice that is easily relied upon during times of stress. I think, you know, the idea of, you know, exercising when you're stressed out or showering, journaling, reading a book, I think these are all amazing and, and they sound easy, but when we are stressed out as youth, I think it's really easy to fall back onto the negative coping skills that we have relied upon. And I think we can't just, we cannot just um, say, like, give these options of self-care, but we need to work to help youth incorporate these um, activities and behaviors into their everyday life so that when something like this happens, we are more equipped to just rely on that instinctively. But in addition to these behaviors, I believe that cognitive skills should be more of a focus. You know, one thing that has become apparent to me is the youth's dependence on friends and support systems to cope. And while that is very important to have, I think we've run into a problem during this time of social distancing and quarantining. As someone recovering from an eating disorder, I struggled with the inability to distract myself from negative thoughts on my own. You know, I have friends that we could go do something fun, and it, and it was easy to get it off my mind. Um, and I often utilize them as a way to just take a step back and do something that makes me happy before I tackle a stressful problem. But that option was taken away from me and all of the youth this year. So, you know, what did we do? We, we scavenged for things at home to make us feel better. And while I think self-care is great, I don't think that it is the only um, part of the solution to the problem. I think it needs to go hand in hand with these cognitive coping skills. And, you know, because I was in therapy and treatment, I have a binder of um, cognitive behavioral therapy strategies that I created that I'm able to use, but many don't have that luxury. And I believe that if students and youth had more training in these cognitive coping skills, that they would be more resilient to this pandemic and other unavoidable stressors. Um, what we realized is this situation isn't malleable. This isn't something we can fix. And it was something that we didn't have an end date to. I think the uncertainty and the the fact that we didn't know when it would be over just and you know exacerbated these these negative thoughts and 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 this spiral of anxiety um and obviously i'm not a trained psychologist but you know what i think we need is this this ability to help train youth in cognitive restructuring and reframing and and the unraveling of cognitive distortions i think if we could cut off the negative thoughts before they turn into actions that would be ideal and and while that's really easier said than done, I think that should be more of a focus. Um, you know, there are other simpler strategies that don't involve cognitive behavioral therapy, but just, you know, emphasizing optimism, motivation, self-belief, values, you know, all of these things, as I mentioned with the self-care, like they, they sound very easy to do when you're not stressed out. But when you're put in that position, we act in ways that don't align with our values. And, and we find it hard to find, you know, the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel, the optimism, the motivation to get out of bed and do the work that we need to do. I think that if um, we are able to uh, emphasize those and make sure that the youth are able to rely on those in moments of stress, um, that that would be crucial. And, and as I mentioned earlier, 
you know, um, while we do see an end to the pandemic, I mean, we have the vaccines coming out. Um, these are skills that can be taken and applied anywhere and everywhere and are things that I believe will go a long way in youth mental health. Again, it's cutting off the pattern of negative thoughts before they're able to turn into these negative coping skills and negative actions. Um, you know, so with that, I think, um, yeah, I just think that should be more of an emphasis. And uh, yeah, so thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much, Ms. Rossell. I just have to applaud your willingness to uh, share your lived experience. Uh, uh, in therapy and, and with uh, eating disorders and to talk about resiliency. It's really encouraging that uh, we see uh, youth and young adults like yourself reaching out to help others who may be struggling. And I'll put a plug in for uh, Dr. Smith and me. We'd love to see you as a psychologist. So we'll talk to you at some later point about that. Um, our final speaker is uh, Carrie Gallagher, an attorney, teacher, school administrator, educational consultant and public speaker. She currently serves as Director of Education at Connect Safely, an internet safety nonprofit based in California. She is also Assistant Principal for Teaching and Learning at St. John's Preparatory School in Danvers, Massachusetts. Her passions include digital wellness, and that's what she's going to talk with us about today. Ms. Gallagher? Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much to the BOAST Forum for bringing this really excellent, distinguished panel together to share, uh, you know, perspectives on youth mental health from um, many areas of expertise. And I also applaud you, Ms. Roussel, for sharing your story and um, for sharing even some strategies that you're using every day right now to help others um, who are listening today, either as professionals or as parents or as educators or maybe even others who are just like you who... Um, We'll learn a lot from, from your perspective. Um, I noticed earlier in the, the Q&A um, area for the forum today that there was a question about the benefits and drawbacks of social media, and that's exactly what I'm here to talk about today. Um, I am also, like Dr. Smith, a parent of two adolescents. Uh, I also work with adolescents every single day at a school for about 1,500 of them as an administrator as a, and a teacher. And, I've been, and have been working as an educator for about 20 years, in addition to my work as an advocate for internet safety and policy making around the empowered use of digital tools for all of us, really, and to um, ensure that both parents and educators don't feel intimidated by the way our youth are attracted to these tools, but rather feel as though it's a way that we can connect with our youth. Um, and with that, I wanted to acknowledge that as our children and ourselves are using technology more and more to do the business of what we do and to connect with other people the way we'd like to, it, what comes with that are some risks. Um, and so today I'll be talking with you about bullying and cyberbullying in particular. We'll define it, um, we'll look at how to identify it, and then we'll also talk about how to prevent it ourselves. So I wanted to start first with the research behind cyberbullying. And first acknowledge that um, a lot of us are certainly familiar with the CDC website now um, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, there is a wealth of resources um, in other areas of health. And um, I wanted to make sure that everyone is aware of the, um, the area of the website that um, covers the Youth Risk Behavior Survey and in particular discusses um, bullying among youth. Um, Pardon me for one second. And uh, nearly every time the Youth Risk Behavior Survey has been unveiled, they have identified that bullying among youth is a serious problem. And so I wanted to really take a moment to define what bullying is um, and note that it isn't uh, an issue that really is isolated to a small group of teens who don't feel like they quote unquote fit in. In fact, a majority of teens report it being the target of bullying, cyberbullying, name calling, and, and rumor spreading. Um, and <clears throat> if we look at the research from Pew, you can see that cyberbullying itself takes a lot of different forms. A lot of times we adults think of cyberbullying as simply name calling online or making fun of someone overtly online, when in, real, in reality it can be the spreading of false rumors, it can be purposely excluding someone or even not tagging someone in a, po in a post. Um, it can mean uh, sexting or 
sending photos of someone that they do not wish to be re revealed or that they do not wish to, to be sent. Um, and so it's important for all of us to be able to identify all the different forms that cyberbullying can take so that we are able and ready to discuss it with the children that we serve and care for. Um, it's important to note the different types of cyberbullying and how they often are um, manifesting uh, in the different um, genders. And so we can see here from this chart that both girls and boys are experiencing cyberbullying, but certainly girls, um, at least at the adolescent age, experience it slightly more than boys. And so it's important to, number one, um, talk to both genders about that particular um, social problem that they may have to encounter and, and, and deal with, but also to make sure that um, girls know how to kind of tackle it head on and are ready for it when it may happen, and that boys are there to um, not just be bystanders, but to be upstanders in the way cyberbullying may affect them directly or may affect the girls that they um, are friends with and care for. In particular, I wanted to acknowledge um, Netflix's recent very high energy docudrama, The Social Dilemma, and how it brought attention to the way our devices and networks are affecting our mental health. In particular, this particular stat really stood out to a lot of people that five, a 5,000 per person study found that higher social media use correlates with self-reported declines in mental and physical health. Um, and I think a lot of people thought of that as the end-all be-all statistic that they took away from the social dilemma, but it's important to couple that with um, other longitudinal research. And in particular, I found this study helpful to, to couple with what we heard from the social dilemma. In this case, um, a longitudinal study from Canada suggested that depressive systems, um, symptoms rather, tend to predict social media use, and it's not necessarily the other way around. I can tell you as someone who um, studies social media use, I'm on my own social media quite a bit, um, and there is a, quite a mix of mindsets and mental health um, being manifested on social media platforms, and um, we should feel as though we can use social media to feel connected with the people that we are unable to see, as Ms. Roussel mentioned, um, but we need to be able to recognize in ourselves um, symptoms and um, times of mental needs that we can seek out the help that we need at the same time. Um, in particular, um, the unprecedented shock of 2020, as was um, uh, noted by both Dr. Smith and um, Dr. Brenzel, um, it definitely threatens the mental health and the future of this generation of adolescents. And um, I myself, as well as the clinicians who are on the call today, are not just concerned about right now, but concerned about, you know, six, 18 months, even two years out, um, the long-term impact of this. And so I think it's important to note that digital media and social media can be a social safety net for our teens, tweens, um, and other adolescents who can't be together right now. Um, the, the research from Pediatrics, which is the, the Journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics, show us that youth are using social media in service of critical adolescent developmental tasks. And those are the developmental tasks that Dr. Smith mentioned in her introduction today, um, that these are, these are ways that our youth are connecting with one another and starting to cement those friendship relationships that are a critical milestone in their development. And so denying our children access to social media is um, while it may prevent cyberbullying altogether, it may also delay the ability um, that our children have in, in meeting those milestones over time. And I think 10 years ago, even eight years ago, early online applications were seen as a way to escape from quote unquote real life. Um, the more recent research is showing that the online environment actually reflects the reality of our adolescents' lives. And so online life and real life are not actually separate genres. They are one and the same. And so it's important for our children to have access to both and for adults to provide opportunities for both as much as possible. Um, so I wanted to move on to really defining cyberbullying and bullying. Um, first, let's really differentiate between the two. Bullying itself is something that happens during contact time. So it happens when children are in the schoolyard together. Um, the bully and the target are both known and named by one another. Um, it usually is isolated to incidents that happen when the target and the child who's engaging in the bullying behavior um, are in the same space. And so it happens and then it's over. 
whereas cyberbullying can happen really any time, any place, or any day because of the nature of these online platforms. The target is often named, but the child who's engaging in the bullying behavior could remain anonymous, and so that makes these circumstances more complicated, especially for adults who are trying to intervene on behalf of a child. It's also very easy for it to be spread. It isn't just isolated to an incident and then it's over. It's easy for someone to screenshot it and share it or retweet it or repost it. Um, and so that can be concerning and can make cyberbullying a bit more harder to contain. Um, anyone can be a bully, a witness, or a target. It's important that we're careful not to use the word bully to label a child. Um, in fact, we as a parent may be surprised to hear our child express um, sentiments that may be consonant with a bullying mentality at some point over the course of their development. It's important to note that that's normal, but it's also important to call your child out and, and really ask them how they're feeling and thinking and how they might redirect their feelings so that they can help that relationship form instead of harm it. Um, rules are changeable. They're based primarily on power. So who in that particular situation has social power and who does not? And that's how you can identify who might be um, behaving in which way. Um, and in order for it to qualify as bullying from a legal perspective, um, and this is sort of that, that legal background of mine coming into play, is that it, it often has to be repeated. So one single incident doesn't qualify as, as bullying from a legal mindset, and that may only come into play as you're considering how to report the instance to school authorities, to the, um, the reporting functions on the actual platform. Um, or to other authorities if you choose to, to go beyond that. Um, but even just one, one incident can certainly have an impact on the mental health um, of children. Um, cyberbullying, like I mentioned, can be um, sending me messages, making up untrue stories, um, telling others to ignore. Um, and as you're talking about bullying with the children that you serve, just know that children don't tend to use the word bullying or adolescents use the word drama. Um, he or she is creating drama online, or I just try to avoid the drama. And so we want to encourage our children to um, not necessarily just avoid the drama if they're acting as a witness because they have some social power to interject and create a better situation, um, but we do want them to be able to identify who has the social power in those situations. Um, I have lots of tips here to, um, to talk about prevention and, and tips for how to talk to your child if they um, engage in bullying or are a victim of bullying, and I'm, I'm more than happy to, to share some of those tips as we move to our, to our question and answer as well. Thank you so much, Ms. Gallagher. It's very helpful to understand more about bullying and cyberbullying and ways that it can be addressed. And thank you to each of our speakers. I'm going to kick off the Q&A session with a question I have for Dr. Brenzel and Dr. Smith. With schools not doing in-person classes in most counties, how can students needing mental health services be identified, and how can those services be provided to students in need? And I'll let either one of you or both of you respond to that. Thank you. Well, this is Dr. Renzo. And, you know, I, I think, Sheila, you point out a, a very uh, important notion because our education system is where children spend a great deal of their time during youth. And so in those systems, very often it's those teachers, school counselors, others that are recognizing, maybe even actively screening, and then often providing linkages, if not on-site services. And so without that, uh, I do think our educators have become very creative through online contact and experience, but it's very difficult to make that up. So those of us in other realms, particularly within healthcare, if we're seeing children in primary care settings, we're seeing children for routine healthcare or acute healthcare issues, it's all the more important that we integrate behavioral health screening into those settings. I think as community members, it's up to us to recognize families that are in distress, children that are in, and youth that are in distress, I think our religious communities are providing significant supports. So this is always true, but all the more true right now. And then building access through uh, implementing parity so that all of our kids have some form of health insurance now, the K Kentucky uh, Children and the KCHIP program for those that are uninsured, uh, but ensuring that our, that our healthcare payers reimburse appropriately for telehealth and that those services 
uh, and those providers remain open and available. Uh, and I think we've done a good job of that. But again, it's going to take all of us to recognize and provide uh, and fill in some of those gaps, particularly that were provided through education uh, all settings. So. Right. Dr. Smith, you want to add anything? Uh, yes, thank you. I would like to add a couple things. I think um, Dr. Brinzel um, spoke um, very in a helpful way about the systems and the ways in which the systems have to sort of um, meet the gap differently now. Um, a couple of additional points that I would add is, is the importance of acting now and not waiting. So as uh, parts of the system, individuals within the community see, see um, symptoms or see behaviors that may be reflective of symptoms, it's really important to respond to those early signs um, because it's the, we, what we, what we can certainly do a better job of addressing behaviors the earlier we see them. So I want to encourage people to act early. Um, and then the other, the other piece that I would add would just be really to emphasize the, the role of community members, family members, support systems. Um, to speak up when you have concerns to, um, I think that one thing that has happened through the COVID pandemic in particular is that conversations about mental health are becoming more normal. People are talking about anxiety and fear and sadness um, around their, their dinner table. And so I just want to encourage folks to find ways to um, open up those lines of communication and, and keep them open. Great, thank you. And for Ms. Gallagher and uh, Ms. Rossell, do you see situations where cyberbullying actually floods a particular school or class within a school? And what can students, faculty, and parents do to put an end to it? Ms. Rossell, I wanted to certainly give you an opportunity to answer first if you'd like. Oh, you can go for it. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, as in my experience as a um, as a parent and a and someone who works in a school every single day, um, I can confidently say that that does happen. And um, when it's recognized, it's important that leading up to that instance, that there has been a culture built that promotes healthy discussion, as Dr. Smith just mentioned, that people are accustomed to. Um, asking for help and that that is celebrated and encouraged in many situations, not just in situations where cyberbullying is at play. Um, that pre-work in developing that culture of sharing and that all of us are in this together to make this a healthy place so that all of us can feel comfortable learning here and safe here, that's the, the most important work that no matter whether we're in a pandemic or not, all of us can take the responsibility to do each and every day so that when a crisis comes up, um, the community is accustomed to banding together and working toward a solution um, for the benefit of everybody. So um, one thing that educators know um, inherently is that there is no, you know, technology tool or perfect school schedule or perfect hybrid or remote model. What makes uh, an education high quality is the foundational relationships that are formed between the students and between the students and the teachers. And if more effort and um, thoughtful design is put into really building those relationships in a strong way, then when that cyberbullying happens, that, that group or that school community can band together. Yeah, just going off that, I would totally agree with the, the environment aspect. I think, you know, when I'm talking to my friends about which professors they like the most, you know, now it's kind of, it's different. It's like, it's not always who teaches the content the best, it's who kind of forms that community. I think. Um, there's a way that teachers and professors can foster, you know, I had one professor who at the beginning of every single class, it took maybe 20 minutes, but we would each go around and every student would say like, do like a little check-in on like what we're doing and how we're doing and, you know, what we did that day. And I just think that in that simple activity, you know, created this, this feeling of community and, and like we were all, you know, even though we weren't actually with each other, you know, that we all kind of, we cared about what we were saying and, and how everybody was doing and and that creates this community that does make pe people feel comfortable with with sharing um more difficult conversations and you know going off of the idea of being able to have those conversations like i was talking about one of the projects that 
um, the Student Alliance for Mental Health Innovation and Action worked on was these discussion cards and, and kind of uh, forming this um, ability to talk about mental health at, before there is a crisis um, and just kind of building that foundation for those conversations before they're necessarily needed. So. I'm sorry, I was muted. Um, and it looks like we've run out of, of time. We had a couple of questions in the Q&A that we're not going to get to. But again, I would remind you that we will follow up via email, um, getting the questions to the uh, speakers and then getting back with you. Uh, this webinar will be posted later this week at the Foundation's website. That's www.healthy-ky.org. And I want to join the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky and Kentucky Youth Advocates in inviting you to share the link with your networks. The last webinar in the BOST Health Policy Forum series is Monday, January 11th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. The title is Stopping Vaping and Substance Use. And our speakers will discuss how the pandemic has impacted substance use and addiction and the policy interventions needed to help protect children and youth. We look forward to seeing you uh, then, and I want to thank you all for participating and wish you all a happy holiday. Thank you very much.